using Google Apps to host guest speakers from anywhere in the world. In this presentation, you're going to learn how to plan and organize a guest speaker session in your target language. For your students, you're going to learn how to host a session using Google Apps. You're going to learn how to record the session to use later as a listening comprehension exercise. And you're going to learn how to find guest speakers to invite to your classroom. I'm Janina Klimas. I have a BA in theater arts and foreign languages and an MA in the teaching of languages. Um, I've had a wonderful opportunities to be able to work with lots of teachers all over the world through ACTFL, their annual convention, through publishing the Language Educator. I have another side to me that's also a polyglot who loves languages. So I spend a lot of time studying languages on my own because it's a passion, but also because I find my language learning or teaching activities for my students, the most engaging ones come from my own personal engagement in language study. And this activity is one of them. So why have guest speakers? Your students will get to have authentic communication with people outside of the classroom community. They'll gain confidence in the target language. They'll have exposure to different accents and dialects. They'll get an opportunity for true immersion using the knowledge and language of a native speaker of the language you're teaching. And it will show students ways to build skills without necessarily going abroad. It's going to show them that what they're learning works and, and you don't need to have this huge life disrupting experience. You can do this with a, just a little bit of time every day and become perfectly proficient in a language. So this is an A-level novice speaker session clip. This person's from Argentina. We're not actually going to watch the clip, but essentially my students had to prepare the questions in advance. And I'll show you exactly how they did that later, but they were really prepared with their questions which they prepared beforehand because they're novice level speakers. They, they speak in words and phrases. They're not really creating with language so much yet. So they had to really kind of load on the front end in preparing their questions. So your step one, you're going to select a theme based on your learning objectives and also the level of the students, obviously. The basic personal information, nature and the environment, education, travel, health, fun and leisure time are just a few. It's great teaching languages because really you can make so many things relevant. Step two, get a Gmail address to access the G Suite apps. Uh, and I have here set, set up your YouTube channel. You can also use Google Meet if you have access to that. And we'll talk about a couple ways. You can record this, do it sort of as a YouTube live, or you can do it as Google Meet. And I think the Google Meet is maybe a use, more user-friendly version and it will save it to your drive. So at the end of the day, the idea for the YouTube channel is to have somewhere to save this. Ensure you have basic equipment, a computer, internet connection, camera and microphone. So here's the, the challenging part, finding a guest speaker. So for many years, I've done these guest speaker activities and They've been mainly for my Spanish classes, so it's been relatively easy to find. And the purpose was having my students be able to speak to someone who's not me and who's not one another, and also for people to be able to guest who have different areas of expertise. Maybe they're huge book collectors or know a lot about movies or know a lot about music. I mean, think about it. All the things that could be so engaging and so interesting to a group of students that fits perfectly into what you're doing in your class. I also have relatives in the Spanish speaking world, but and friends, the, the fact of the matter is the, their schedules don't always work with mine. And one of my favorite discoveries as an independent language learner has been italki that I brought over into my classroom. So it's italki.com. And essentially, there's lots of tutors and language teachers offering lessons. And so you'll have to pay a little bit to, to do this activity, but I think it's well worth it. Um, you basically hire the teacher. You tell them what 
what your objective is that you really want your students to be able to practice and, and you'll find somebody appropriate. There's, especially if you are teaching in a language that's well-spoken and a lot of these people, they're, they're super passionate. They're, they're compassionate. They're polyglots. They love languages. And a lot of them are living abroad in different places so that they can learn other languages and cultures. So you'll find people 24 seven who are available in a way that fits your schedule in a way that you wouldn't necessarily with a friend or a relative. So if you see there's lots of filters, you can find somebody, they've got their schedule, their interface is improving all the time. You see, I found someone from Argentina. And after I've hired the person and just messaged them telling them what we're doing, I make a collaborative Google Doc. And all the people who are going to be part of the conversation, except for the speaker, share this Google Doc. And you can do this old school. You can do it paper and pencil. It doesn't really matter. But there's a specific reason I like to use a collaborative Google Doc. And especially now, so many of us are at home. This would be essential. So the purpose of making the collaborative Google Doc is that you don't have any repeat questions whether you're doing this from home or from your classroom. So here I have my criteria. It's just example criteria. Um, I had our student write original questions and depending on how big your class is, you're gonna wanna give them a certain number of questions. And they also have to edit the questions. So, so you tell them that you're going to expect that not only do they write their own questions that are original, so if somebody asked what your name is, First, then they can't use that one. They have to do something different and whatever theme you have. And they also have to edit. So that makes them aware of things like diacritical marks and punctuation, things like that. And then after you're done, you have all of these questions and you can actually print out the interview. And of course, if it's a shared Google Doc, they all get to have their own copy. And so then when you actually connect with the interview. I did this one on YouTube Live and I did a Hangout on Air, but YouTube and Google, they're constantly evolving. And so now I might do this on Google Meet if I had it, but this is an alternative YouTube Live too. So a live streaming event. And essentially I always practice a couple of times, right? I've got my, my practice with YouTube or Google Meet, which is just more and more intuitive all the time, these things. So I, I would probably use Google Meet now. Um, though I like doing this on YouTube too, because then it's an easy place to save it if you want to make a listening activity after. After you've practiced, again, the interface is always changing, but you can do YouTube Live, Hangout on Air, or Google Meet. Or there's other tools that we'll talk about a little bit later if you're a Skype user. I practice, start my broadcast. See, that's me. I'm, I, I'm practicing. And you do the interview with the students and they're noting the answers. So they're actually that document you made. This is now a really active activity. So they're filling in, they're asking their questions and every student has a document and they're filling in everyone's answers. They can just be like one word, two word. And the objective is to get all the answers to the questions. And this is a, a B level speaker um, or actually she's not a B level speaker. I'm sorry. She's a native uh, from Argentina, but she's, She's working with B-level students. So they ask lots of further questions. She's really super interesting person. And again, just like your guest speakers are going to have lots of interesting things to talk about with your students, these teachers do too. I mean, this, this woman knows multiple languages. She's traveled. She has a business and marketing degree. She lives in Buenos Aires. I mean, we, we, we had so much to talk about with her. Um. So then you're going to save the interview. And I, I have it here saved to my YouTube channel. But again, if you do Google Meet, it will save right to your Google Drive. And the idea behind that is so anybody who is absent can still participate in that cultural and communicative activity. So then you've got the Creator Studio where I'd either upload my copy or publish my copy. Um, and another recording option is Ecamm. And Ecamm works with Skype and it'll record um, just like 
just like we just did with Google Hangouts on air. Um, and I actually prefer Ecamm personally because um, I like Skype. But again, those those Google apps are just more and more intuitive all the time. So it's also a way to do some professional development in advanced language. When I first started teaching Spanish, I was probably a, a, a fairly typical non-native speaker. I was sort of high B2 level, low C1. Um, and I really discovered that it was going to be a whole lot better for me and my students if I could get up to having the proficiency of a native speaker. And I spent a lot of time abroad and I spent a lot of time on input. Lots and lots of books, lots and lots of reading, lots and lots of studying. And this is a way to continue to do that from anywhere in the world. If you want to improve whatever language you're working on, you have access to people that you can connect with in the next hour and meet with them on a regular basis and really up your com communicative confidence as well as all the interesting things that they're going to share with you that you can ultimately share with your students that will keep them really involved in language learning. And this is just another another example. Um, Leanne Stanfield, if you back. Some, some other Google Apps I want to talk about for your language class as we're all spending a lot of time inside right now, but even not, they, they've got some great capabilities for language teachers. Um, I love Google Maps. And one of the issues I have with Google is that the users can can pick the language unless you have sort of locked down browsers, which I don't right now. Um, this is where I live and this is Korean. And so for giving directions, I would take a screenshot, do the language settings, take a screenshot and have students describe how to get from one point to another in the target language. And again, if you've taken a screenshot of it, they can't change the language settings and they can they can write it out. Giving directions is difficult because you have to know the place as well as you have to know lots and lots of language to be able to do it. So an activity like this is great practice. So if I were teaching, uh, doing this activity, teaching French, for example, I might take some places in Paris or somewhere else where I, that I'd really like to get my students familiar with and do how to get from here to there. And I would do maybe 10 screenshots and they have to actually answer in in French. It's great cultural, communicative, real life activity, useful. Forms, I love forms. So what's cool about forms is that you can do lots of language experience approach activities. So again, the user can change the language. So in, you don't have a whole lot of control over that. But to use this in a class, you can have students quickly do this, and even if they've hit Google Translate, it's maybe only a couple of minutes that they're spending time in that activity. You get to use the results for language experience activities. So what that means is when you go over to the responses, it's going to show you all these different graphs, and you get to use those essentially as speaking prompts. So even if they weren't getting or they chose not to take the input that you gave them through all the questions in the target language and, and all the, the, the possible responses, they get to use all those prompts and you can, you can go over how many people have, you know, more than five people in their family, for example. They're great visual speaking prompts. Google Docs, amazing. So we talked about how to, collaboratively do an activity here. Um, some other ways that I like to use Google Docs is for something I like to call fluency writing. So essentially, um, fluency writing is a check-in I do with myself as a language learner and with my students. And I pick a topic, whatever topic I'm learning about, and I make it a pretty short period of time for the sort of A and B levels. And I say, all right, Talk as much as you can about fill in the blank. It could be the family. It could be about your house. It could be about school. I mean, there's so many possibilities. And I give a time limit. And I journal about it. And I don't allow myself any aids until after when I look things up. You can also do this on Google Docs. So 
give them the topic and, and they can write. But one thing I like about this, when you're in that A level as a learner, learning how to use the, the built-in dictionaries, if you're really struggling, you're really getting started, it can be really helpful. Instead of just writing out and translating, take your time and look up words as you go. It can be really valuable learning experience. And then again, anything that's collaborative. So students can do, you know, question and answer. They can um, do lots of uh, projects on this. It's it's a useful tool when, when used correctly and for anything collaborative. Uh, Google Slides. So one of the ways I really like to use Google Slides are with collaborative presentation. So what's really nice about Google Slides, of course, right now we can present from wherever as long as your students have access to your Google Drive. Um, but some other ways that I really like to use it are collaborative slides. So assigning something to a group of students. So for example, doing emotions, I, I will allow all of my students to make a slide where they're showing an emotion and they write the emotion on it. I then go back and I, I make corrections like sort of, uh, you know, correct the diacritical marks, et cetera. And then I download it and I do a voiceover just like you're listening to right now. And I show them the movie that we made together. Another great way to use this right now is with an app called Fishbowl, F-I-S-H-B-O-L-E dot I-O. And it integrates with your, your Google apps. And what's amazing about it is that students can do oral presentations that are recorded and they can submit them to you. So for example, um, I don't know if any of you know who Benny Lewis is, uh, fluent in three months. He started blogging years ago. Funny, amazing guy, very successful language learner, and he's had this very interesting life, uh, and he's he's got all this wonderful advice for people. He kind of threw out all the textbooks and decided, you know, he was just going to speak and learn languages and completely changed his life through it. Um, I've written some articles on his blog. Uh, all of his advice is fun and practical, and for years, he did a series as he was traveling all over the world, uh, sort of digital nomad type lifestyle where he was giving tours of his house. And he would just do a video tour of his house in sort of whatever language that he was learning. And when he moved to New York, because it was multicultural, he did it in a bunch of languages that he knew. So your students could make a slide or several slides rather of their house, like five rooms in their house. And then they can use this fishbowl app to narrate it. Anything that you're doing right now, family, clothing, any presentation you want students to do that they can't do in person for obvious reasons, they can do using Google Slides and the fishbowl app. It's very cool. And then you, you, can, you can listen to it, you can share, kids can comment. It's great. Um, Gmail, obviously. Um, lots of pen pal activities. And again, the user can select what language they want to use. So they have to decide what they want to get out of it. But it's, it's a great way to practice real life communication by writing letters. Either students write them to each other, they CC you on them, or pen pal exchange with another class in, in your target language country. Um, so I just wanted to show you my blog. If you want to visit, I publish lots and lots of stuff because I'm a language nut, language learner, language teacher, love it. And I love sharing stuff with all of you. Um, and it, I hope that some of that stuff is helpful to you as a teacher and learner.